first is to, we'll talk about some of the, the green aspects of the building. Wakefield, when the project is completed, I am told will be the greenest building in Arlington. We are at a level of, green, of lead gold. I have heard discussion, I don't know where it will go if it's possible for lead platinum, but we are, we have met the qualification, will meet the qualifications for lead gold. Uh, some of the green elements of the building are still under construction, so we have not applied for our green certification yet. The major part of the construction is what you saw where the old building used to be. They are drilling geothermal wells. They're drilling 400 geothermal wells. Each one will be 500 feet deep. Those should be completed by the summer. And we will switch over to using those geothermal wells for the heating and the air conditioning in the building. And I think at that point, then we will be, that's the last major element of the construction project for this building in terms of the lease certification. Uh, we have, when you, if you came in through the parking lot through entrance one, there was a rain garden on your uh, right hand side. That rainwater collects all the water that comes off the roof, which is white. Uh, which is a, a green, another green feature. The water then it goes down and filters to the ground. There is a large cistern that collects the water under the parking lot, and that water is used to uh, do the brown water in the building. Uh, we on the roof there are solar panels and solar hot water panels that heat that collect the solar power and then also heat the water. Um, I believe the heating water is used for the pool. <laughs> yes. Uh, the pool is attached. I don't know, was the pool part of your tour? Yes. Okay, so you saw it is attached to the building. Uh, the Wakefield students are very happy about that because the old building they had to go out in the cold and that was a big disincentive to swimming. Um, another green feature, like you can see in this room, there's a, if you look up in the ceiling there, there's a little white knob in the middle of that tile next to the light. That is a light sensor and it senses the amount of daylight coming in from the windows and will automatically dim the lights uh, if it's not necessary to have the lights on at full strength. Uh, Ms. Gregory pointed out about not having recycling in the cafeteria. We actually have recycling is built in. Um, I don't know why they didn't use it this evening. Um, and then there are where major hallways come together in the building are other built-in play stations for trash and plastic recycling and paper recycling. The signs right now are great. We just moved in in August and we had about two weeks to get ready before the students arrived. Our priority was getting the instructional program ready for students. Uh, now we're working through making kind of the, the nicer features of like that will label the signs nicely for the recycling and that kind of stuff. Students do really a pretty good job of recycling. Um, we have a couple clubs that work on recycling and collecting that for, for the school system. The old building, uh, their goal was to recycle 95% of that building uh, in various ways. And um, if you saw the demolition process, you saw that it was actually purposeful in how they did it. That was, with, again, with the goal of recycling. Um, all of the class, there are almost all the spaces in the building have natural light um, access. This courtyard here is slightly smaller than the other one. Uh, and the main purpose for this one is to provide light wells for classrooms that surround this area instead of having this all closed in. And then if you notice in all, a lot of the hallways, all the stairwells have glass access as well uh, to provide natural light for the building. Uh, a design feature of the building when you came in was the town hall. Uh, that was a space that we purposefully asked for on the committee. I was on the, the BLPC, the Building Level Planning Committee, from the very first meeting back in 2006. So for me, it's kind of nice to go see, to see from the very first meeting to now how we're using the building. It, it's been an amazing process to see that. Uh, but when we talked with the architects, we said we wanted a heart of the building. One of the things that Wakefield was known for was it was it's a warm school. Uh, we have an, an extremely diverse student body, but we all get along. It was just people would come in and say, if you just walk in the hall, it's just it's warm. 
and we didn't want to lose that warm feeling. But in the old building, we didn't have a heart. I don't know if you were in the old, familiar. It was basically a square with four uh, lobbies. In the lobby outside the, the main gym was as close to a heart as we shot, but it didn't have comfortable seating. It wasn't big enough for a lot of people. So we, the architects designed the, the town hall, and that space is used. If you come in in the morning, that's where students, when they come in off the bus or they walk, they'll, they'll meet their friends there, they sit, they talk, they read, they prepare for tests, they socialize. Um, we have a strict rule, no food or drinks on the coffee, and they argue with me a little bit about that until they started seeing spills on the chairs and things, and now they kind of police themselves. Um, so, but it's a really nice thing because um, one of the things that's important to us as a staff is that we prepare our students to be successful beyond high school. And inter-social interaction is an important element of that. And we wanted this space then to be available for students to have conversations. And, and I will walk around and other staff members will do the same if I see students sitting with headphones in. And I was like, you know what? We designed this space for you to talk. <laughs> and you're sitting here with headphones in looking at a little screen and your friend's sitting there with headphones in looking at a screen. You don't need to be in this beautiful space for that. So, in, have you asked, how's your friend doing today? Maybe you should ask them how they're doing today. And so, you can, and, and so it, is, it is nice to see that. Um, the size of the school, the building is designed to accommodate about 1,950 students. This year we are at 1,550 students. Of the three comprehensive high schools in Arlington, we are now the smallest. Um, we are projected to grow. We will hit, the last projections I saw, we will hit 1,900 in a, uh, three to four years. Um, so like all the schools in Arlington, we are um, facing a, a, an increasing enrollment. But this time we have the capacity to absorb what is projected to come with to us in the next several years. Um, and so we do have an extremely diverse student body. We have no student group that one racial or ethnic group that's the majority. We have students from over 90 countries speaking over 20 languages. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible, wonderful mix of students. So uh, if you all have questions. Yeah. You mentioned recycling <coughs> the auditorium chairs that have been donated by a lot of groups and families for plaques. What happened to them? The plaques themselves we took off what we have but we also remade the plaques exactly as they were in the old auditorium. And we, will, we are going to put them on the arm to rest in the new auditorium. So while well, it's not the same chairs, they will have a chair for them in the new so auditorium. So have they recycled the chairs? Um, I don't think they were, it, there was a plan at one point that they were gonna to go to another school, <coughs> but as they got in there and started working with them, my understanding is the chairs were not in good enough shape to, to so they recycled the chairs but not moving them to another school. A big problem in Arlington and maybe at Wakefield also is a performance gap between, educational performance gap between black students and white students. What is Wakefield doing to decrease the gap, eliminate the gap, especially getting families and community, community leaders to perform the primary responsibility that they have for educating their children? We do have, like all the many schools in the country, we do have a gap uh, between um, white students and our black and Hispanic students. We have done a lot to close the gap. We're, we've made significant progress. We still obviously have work to do. Um, and you can measure the gap in any number of ways. You can close it in one area. Like in our SOL results, our pass rates, we've done a pretty decent job of eliminating the gap on the pass rates. But we weren't satisfied with just saying, okay, well, we took it. If you look at the SOLs, we're, we're in good shape. We want the next step. We said, well, what about the advanced pass rate? And we noticed that there's a gap there. We said, what about our AP scores? And there's a gap there. We said, we look at our discipline record. We have, there are issues there. We look at our SAT scores. 
So it's, there are many elements of when you speak to the achievement gap. There are many aspects to look at. And so one of the things that I think is a strength of the Wakefield community is we don't just take the easiest measure and then say we're done. Uh, some of the things that we are doing is, in terms of specifically working with families, is Wakefield has what we call our summer home visit transition program. And I will tell you our goal, and I'll be honest, we've not met our goal, but our goal is to visit the families of every rising ninth grader in their home the summer before they start school. And like I said, we haven't met that goal. We have been anywhere from last summer we actually scaled back a bit because with all of the move and everything we were more targeted in our visits and we did about 50 in other summers we've done 130 to 170 home visits and on the home visits there's two staff members that go and we're very um, structured in how we do the visits we don't go in with a bunch of papers and we don't go in and say we're going to tell you about Wakefield we go in usually with nothing um, in terms of papers. We're not taking notes. We're not writing down. We're we want to hear from you. And the last question that we end with for the parent is, what are your hopes and your, your dreams for your child? And then you ask the child, what are your hopes and dreams? And then how can Wakefield help you achieve that? And those conversations are incredible. That many times parents and students have never had that conversation and so that opens up we usually mean it to be our last question as we're getting ready to leave but that's actually then the visit stays on many times uh, so um, and the reason we do it in the, the family's home is that's their setting where they are comfortable many times coming into a school is off-putting mm -hmm. and and that's that's not a productive conversation. So we go and visit them in the home. They're safe at home. They're, they're safe at home. And there are families that will not, they, they don't want us to come to their home for any number of reasons. We don't judge. We, we'll have meet you at the library. We've gone to McDonald's. We've met at Starbucks. Um, you, you won me over and talked talk about the heart. Yeah. Because my second born went into the Bishop Ireton. And come to Wakefield. I won't go into the reasons. She was a very good student. I was allowed to come and visit the students. I wanted to know what they thought of their school. And they had the heart then, and from what looks like guides, they had the heart now. And to me, that's more important than my brand new wide halls. And so the next five of my children came to me. But um, the school isn't as important to me as those students that right. are in it. Right. And having it all be one world and then locked. And they've all been very successful. Great, thank you. When I start out with senior project and when they're juniors, when I introduce it, I say, so just close your eyes, imagine the last time you were offered the opportunity to take a class, and the class has no title. You know, you get to name the class, you get to decide what it's about. You get to decide what materials are being taught. You get to decide who's teaching it, where the materials are coming from, what the experience. You even get to decide when it's over. You, you set the presentation date. And so the, the planning process is, as you can imagine, a very important part of it. You know, problem solving, planning, prioritizing. So they do the planning. They set their date. They go through the year. They do their project. The assumption is that they're doing a lot of the project outside of school. You know, learning to be a barber. I mean, they're every, everything is here. So a lot of it they're doing outside of class. And because of that, when they're in their senior project class, as long as they're documenting satisfactory progress in their senior project class, they can be studying for a government test, or they can be doing their English English essay. The assumption is that they're they're grown, you know. And we, what we're trying to do, of course, is prepare them for college, or for work their work like afterwards. So it's about prioritizing. They make a lot of mistakes. They do a lot of procrastinating. But we it's it's a lot about life skills. Um, Darcy. Um, is that she presented recently and I chose her to talk to you because we have a lot of we have kids at all levels who are some are really excited and they, they know in the summer exactly what they're going to do and they're going to the Philippines and they're going to go diving and then there are others who come in here 
kicking and screaming and moaning and saying, I'm transferring to W now and I don't want to do this. And why are we doing it? And why are we the only high school that has to do this? And, and they, they really, really, really hate it. It, it has a reputation. Um, and so she was one of those. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you're one of those. And um, so I really wanted you to hear from her because there's such a range, but she, um, she kind of went through the metamorphosis. She changed a lot along the way. So I'll let her talk a little bit about her project. <laughs> The title of my project was A Day in the Life of a Dreamer. So the topic was basically about undocumented youth. And the reason why I chose my topic was, for one, I am a dreamer myself. So um, I didn't know any of the laws in the country about um, undocumentation, immigrants, or um, dreamers. So I felt really useless, and I had no idea what was going on in my country, and I'm living here not knowing what they're doing about us. And I also wanted to give awareness about what a dreamer was, because mostly when people ask me what's the name of your topic, I said a day in the life of a dreamer, they asked me what's a dreamer, is it somebody that dreams? And I was like, kind of, sort of, but not really. And I had so, no idea what I was going to do. Um, also, um, my procrastination came out a lot during this project, because my presentation was May 8th. So back in September, I was like, I got enough time, I'm going to get this done, <laughs> I, I don't got to worry about it. And then once March and April started coming around the corner, I was like, okay, maybe I should do something with my project. And <laughs> I had some hours, not a lot. Um, so then if you don't get your paperwork done, which is an essay and a bunch of other components, you go to Summer Institute. And I was like, okay, you don't want to go to Summer Institute. You want to have fun this summer. And yeah, I want to graduate. So, and I thought you did, you couldn't walk either. So I was like, yeah, I really have to get this done. So I came to Ms. LaBella and I was like, hey, Ms. LaBella, I have to get this done. And I was with her t every day, like all day, since like third period on to the rest of the school day. And I got my paperwork done. And I tried to persuade her. I was like, Ms. Bella, you think you can extend my deadline a little bit? I'm kind of in a um, sticky situation right now. I haven't done it. And she's like, no, you can get it done in two days. So she made it. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned it in. Oh, not the problem. Oh, yeah, the paperwork, the paperwork. I got it done. I turned it in. And I was like, okay, I've got this. Now it's, I had a video component, part of my senior project. It was one of my objectives. And I was like, okay, I can get this done. I got my paperwork done. I can get my video done. So I talked to my consultant. We got, we scheduled everything. I interviewed everybody. I had an interview. I, I got all the pictures I needed, all the videos I needed. And the video was done. It was, it was ready to go by the time my senior project came around the corner. So procrastination is a huge obstacle when it comes to seniors, like myself. I thought hard about it and I was like, okay, maybe I should have done it before. And I tell, I, I talk to freshmen and I'm like, okay, at juniors, I'm like, you should start over the summer. Like, make sure you know what you're doing. And make sure the topic you're doing is something you actually want to do. Make sure everything that you're going to do is reasonable for you. Because as soon as you're done with the paperwork, getting it accepted by Ms. LaBella, doing your proposal, it's all on you. You're responsible for all of it. It's all done outside of school because you you have a class period of an hour and a half, and you're not gonna get your project done in an hour and a half every other day. So I I tell them all the time. I was like, do it, do it, and do it. Um, I learned so many opportunities out of this the project. Um, I was at Attorney General Hearings um, press conference when he announced the state tuition. So where else was I going to get the opportunity to go to something so big if it wasn't for the dream project? And I wouldn't be in the dream project if I didn't have senior project. So we've also got invited to um, Governor Terry McAuliffe's inaugural. So it's it's all these opportunities that come out of the project. So it's senior project is about networking, and I learned how to network because I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was like, I'm just going to do my project on my own. I don't need help from anybody else. I'm, I'm fine. And once I started my project, I was like, yeah, Ms. LaBella, I need your help. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and my consultant, I was kind of iffy about asking her for help. But then once I started getting, talking to her and actually telling her, she would be like, okay, so what's your project about? You haven't even told me what your project was about. And I was like, yeah, I did. And she was like, no, you didn't. And then, so I, I started, becoming open. I knew how to explain myself, like tell people what I need help in, what I can't do, and what I can do. Um, it also taught me um, how to write a good paper because my paper was really good. Um, so <laughs> it, it really helped me. I, I never wrote a 10 page essay before and I did. And I was like so surprised with myself and I was like, I can do this then. 
And I also learned how to tell my story. I became proud of who I was, a dreamer. And I wouldn't have gotten that from going out and talking to somebody on the street. It's, it, come, it came from the project. It came from Senior Project and the Dream Project because the Dream Project is where I learned it. And if it weren't for Senior Project, I wouldn't be in Dream Project. So it all comes together. And I also um, learned that it's about responsibility and getting you ready for the workforce. Because when you go to a workforce, they're not going to tell you, okay, is, are you on time with your deadline? Have you got this done? Are you in the process of doing it? They just give you a, a, a duty and you have to get it done. It's not about, okay, can we extend the deadline? Can you give me a little bit more time to finish this? It's all about you doing it and you getting it done on your own time. So it taught me time management because I really really self-edit before right. this. People, students like myself have such a bad image on the senior project because it, it, you start and you're like, man, everything's on me. Why do I have to do this? In senior experience, all they got to do is find a place to go work and they go work for hours and I'm over here doing a project. Like, why do I need this to graduate? It's pointless. It's useless. But once you start getting your mind into a positive set, you learn all these skills, life skills, that you're not going to learn in senior experience. You're not going to learn how to stand up in an audience. I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for senior project. I was so nervous to go up to my senior panelist, which was like four people. And because of the senior project, I've learned how to oral speak. Like, I can speak now. I can talk to you. I can stay on topic. I, I, I can talk. And so it, it's like... All the skills you learn, it's, senior project's not about passing it. It's not about, oh, okay, if I don't pass it, I'm not going to graduate. No, it's about the skills that you learn. Because those skills are going to stay with you forever. Math classes, history classes, I don't remember what I learned freshman year. And I, I'm pretty sure I will learn, I will remember everything that I did in senior project. One, because it's something that I wanted to do. And two, because it pushed me. It's all about me sitting down with myself and saying, okay, Darcy time to get it done. So that's why I think the senior project is such a good experience for everybody and it should continue to be in her school. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I think they start out excited and then they realize that it really is on them. But they're, they're going to get guidance, but it's a lot of responsibility. Um, and, but then when, when people start presenting and they see each other's work, it, it really is contagious. Then they they, they want to go for the outstanding. It's not enough just to get the senior project. They want to go for the outstanding. And so they go do the extra interview. They, they, they really work on their PowerPoints to enhance them. We are really serious. She's not kidding about, about Summer Institute. If you write your proposal and you write your timeline and you're going to do this, 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 and this, and you're going to be done by March, you're going to be ready to present, I make the calendar. I put everybody's dates on there. I submit the calendar. I say, this is your date. Is this what you want? Yeah, this is what I want. If, you, if that date comes and you have not turned in your paperwork, which is your essay and, and the, the information that goes to your panel, you go to Summer Institute. It's two weeks in the summer. It's, um, it, it, they can still walk across the stage if they haven't failed other classes, but they don't get their, it, it delays their diploma until um, till August. It's like summer school. And we do it for a reason. You know, we, we, there's so much that's negotiable. There's so many things that they sort of squeeze out. Of, and, and our students come back from college every single year, every single year and say it's their AP classes and senior project that prepare them for college. That when they get these assignments in college, they get these large things where they have to manage their time, they have to problem solve, they hit a problem, they, they've, they've done it before. And it's, we hear it over and over and again. So we know it's important. Summer Institute seems really ruthless and they, I mean, it's like birthing babies every day, you know, trying, trying, <laughs> trying, trying to get them. It really is, they're, they're so angry and upset and, and, and you know, it's stressful. Senior year is stressful. They're applying to college and they're trying to get scholarships and they can't afford to go to school and they're scared to leave and they can't wait to go. And it's a very difficult time. And, and, and so it, it is a lot. But we know, um, I mean, we do give them a lot of support. We do give them, a, there's, there's a lot of resources. Uh, there are a lot of resources here for them. But we really do know that bottom lines are important in life and that, 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 that we are giving it to them. And it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, have been in this country for one year, or if you're in special education, self-contained, or if you're taking five million AP classes. Everybody does it. Everybody presents to this panel of four. Everybody's picture ends up on the TV. I don't mean, know if you've seen them rolling it through the night, but um, it, it levels the playing field in our school. You know, every everyone does it, and we're really it's our 18th year of doing it. The other high schools have adopted senior experience, which is three weeks at the end of the summer, at the end of the school year. It exempts them from. Um, uh, 
their final exams, the kids that do it, they, um, it's just a different thing. You know, we do, this is full year life skill training. So they do an essay, six to eight page expository essay. They do a PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi. They have to have some sort of um, presentation, electronic presentation and some kind of visual aid. They have kids fixing cars, they bring their cars. We had a girl one year who trained a horse that somebody gave her a horse that was absolutely wild. She learned about horse training, she took classes, she worked with this horse, she documented the whole thing and she brought the horse into the field when she gave the presentation. Um, so they're visually, they've, we've got kids building computers. There's a lot of our kids end up going into fields that they started in their senior project. A lot of them do career types of explorations. And, and we always tell them, you know, it's, sometimes they decide that, that it's not the career for me at all, which to me is a successful project because mm -hmm. it's one thing you can cross off the list. And even those who go to Summer Institute or the, who don't, who end up with a pass rather than a pass plus or an outstanding, see, aren't they beautiful? Um, what we tell them is that this is a success. You know, you have, it, even if it was late, um, if you make these mistakes now rather than in college or rather than in your job, then, then this is a successful experience for you. And that's what they do tell us. That's, you know, we did it here, and like she said, you know, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> so, not like this. She's not going to procrastinate. She's going to do lots of projects in the future. She's really good, good at this. How do you evaluate the projects? It's a great question. There are rubrics. There are four, they're graded on four things, ultimately. Their journal, which is which they're keeping throughout the year, and they have to turn their journal in or, or show their journal every two weeks to make sure that they are keeping up to date with it. And they, um, so it's their journal, it's their um, uh, presentation, which is an, they get an audiovisual presentation grade and their oral presentation grade, and then the essay. So there's the four components, the rubrics, they get a handbook at the beginning of the year and it's online. So they have the rubrics at the beginning of the year, they know exactly, you know, how many hours and what, you know, what's, what needs to be there. They all have to have a consultant in the community. So um, they, somebody who's an expert, an expert on, on, in the field. So they all are working with somebody that they don't know. They're making contacts. And even the smallest things like, you know, I send an email and I waited for three weeks and they never emailed me back. I mean, that's a big mistake if you're trying to contact somebody. You know, when you make an e send an email and you don't hear anything in a couple of days, you follow up with a phone call or another email. But those kinds of mistakes that they make and they, and they waste time, they lose time, they reflect on it later in their, in their journal. You know, I should have done this, I should have done that, next time I'm gonna do that. And, and it's, it's training that we're just not giving kids anymore. Um, I really respect my school for um, sort of bucking the system because um, it is a lot of personnel hours. It, it takes a lot, but it's some of the only real performance-based learning we're doing day to day in the classroom. You know, there's so much, so much testing and um, so many filling in bubbles that um, this does require a lot and it gets harder and harder to justify because you can't quantify it the way you can test scores. So um, I, I'm, I'm concerned that over time, you know, as we get more and more into, you know, which, which school, and which system has whatever scores, that it's something that's, um, that may go by the wayside because it's hard to quantify. But so far, I mean, we, we, we get so much good press for this. Our kids come back every year and, and we know what we do. So we're really, really proud of it. And, and from, from the student's point of view, uh, what kind of grade or, or do they get? What do they get? What can they aspire to? Yeah, well, they um, through the year, it's pass-fail throughout the year. that They just get a satisfactory and unsatisfactory, and that's based on their journal. You know, what, if they write a proposal, they get a grade for, for staying with that, and then journaling. So all the way, as long as they're making steady progress, it's, it's a satisfactory. When they give their presentation, they can, they're, um, they can get an outstanding. They can get a, a, a pass-plus or they can get a pass. And it's all based on, on these rubrics. And it's, it's, very, it's very clear, and, and, um, and they have a panel of four. And the panel is um, their teacher advisor, it's their consultant from the community, it's a student that they pick, and then it's the mystery panelists, which Lynn Jewell is one of them, and Rosalie was one for them. They're all retired teachers, and so they've all seen a million senior projects. So even though there's sometimes a real discrepancy, like a consultant may not really have any experience with high school writing and think something is really, really good, and we're looking at it thinking, this is really bad, and vice versa. Um, somehow with the student and everybody, it really, it's amazing how you can, it, it comes out the way it's meant to come out. And um, the kids, once they get a pass, they're not very happy anymore because a pass is just a pass, and they see all these kids just really going for it, and, and so they go for the pass plus of it or the outstanding. Um, so in the end, if they've gotten all unsatisfactory, if they have had unsatisfactories along the way, the teacher has, those, those technically take the grade down, 
like like if it goes from a B to a B minus or B, you know, C to C plus, whatever. Um, but it's it's up to the teacher. So they don't have to use those outstanding. They don't have to hold those up, those unsatisfactories against the student. And most often they don't. I mean, our feeling is that if a student eventually engages and, and pulls it together and does a great project and, and pulls it off, not at the very last minute, but we really try to encourage that. You know, if you've learned the lessons and, and you've made it, then more power to you. How do you think, where did the consultants come from? How, how do you... Do I have, students have to find them, or you, you have a well, panel? Well, the students do have to find them, and I, often and I tell them, it's, you don't go up to somebody and say, I've got a project, will you be my consultant? Mm -hmm. You know, they do volunteer work, or they, you know, they take a class, or some, they take an art class, and, and as they develop a relationship with people that they're working with, then they can say, well, this is part of my senior project, this is it, this is my proposal, would you be willing to meet with me three times about my project and come to my presentation? I, I really like to them to try to find their own person, but then I, I'm willing to say, well, I, I have got, got some people here, go ahead and contact them. And that's one of many things, you know, writing emails and contacting people and following up. And these are life skills that, I mean, these kids don't want to talk on the phone to anybody anymore. You know, if it's not texting, it's like, it's scary. And so they're doing this. They're contacting people they don't know and sitting in here with Kim Duran interviewing her. You know, it's, it's, it's just amazing. I must say that you and Darcy have obviously manifested true believership in this whole <laughs> program, and it's very persuasive. I, I'm really very proud of Arlington and, and Wake Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's certainly not ye old high school anymore. Right. Well, <laughs> it's true, and, it, it's, um, and it, to us, it's, it's a, it gets harder to justify. We've got a different student a population that is has a lot of academic challenges and you know we could be hiring you know getting 15 more people to be teaching you know the, the English SOL but it's it is really a priority and, and I'm, I am also proud that there's also I mean we're convincing but I've got a stack here of the anonymous evaluations that the students do after they present before they even get their grade it's totally anonymous about the project about what they got out of it how they would describe their project and even the students who say, no, we should not, it shouldn't be a graduation requirement. That's the biggest thing. They, they think, yes, we should have it, but it shouldn't have to be a graduation requirement. But on those same ones where they say it shouldn't be a graduation requirement, the comments are always, you know, this is really an amazing experience. You know, that's youth. You know, of course, it's, it's, we don't, we'd rather not, not have to be pressured. But, but you can read them. It's just amazing how they come to understand that it's a gift that we give them. And I, I tell them, I said, someday, you know, just you got to trust the adults and the, that love you, that someday you're going to understand that we did this because we want you to survive. You know, that there are things you're not learning um, that you're going to need to have, especially our, you know, our kids who come from disadvantaged homes or that have not lived in this country their whole life. And, and there's just a lot to learn that they're not getting at home or in school anymore. So we thank you. I, we really appreciate you guys hearing about this because we know what you're doing. Do you have any follow-up way to evaluate uh, their performance in the project versus their performance in later college or some mm -hmm. other? Activity? That's a really good. Uh, that's a really good question. And no, we don't. Uh, we a lot of many, 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 many of our students come back, and we are in touch with many of our students either on Facebook or they come back for alumni day in droves. Um, that would be a really, a really interesting thing. Miss Emma. Was to Hana, what's her image? Oh, Dr. Dr. Veal and Sanchez. Okay. She is a good friend, and uh -huh. she, she has told us it. on several occasions that she's really concerned about the success of her Hispanic students, friends, uh -huh. later in college. Uh -huh. And so she works hard to uh -huh. beat them up, test them, et cetera, et cetera. But I wonder uh -huh. if, if anyone's ever tried to structure an evaluation of this wonderful program in their success, whatever it is, being a barber or being a mechanic or being a college. It's a really good idea, and I and I think I think that's something to look at because we do hear it a lot. I mean, it, it just sort of anecdotally, a lot of the kids that have done projects, um, you know, done a medical, you know, something in the medical field, end up being in medicine or did mm -hmm. did on physical therapy. Yeah, they go into physical therapy. Find, find a kid with statistical interest. In and and, we, and that's that's the kind of thing that we absolutely would do. Mm -hmm. Find somebody who would. Um, and, and we are kind of learning as we go along now that all this technology is available to follow kids. It's really hard. A lot of kids disappear. It, it's, it's hard to get contact information with kids until they come back. But that's a really good idea. And I would be interested because right now it's very hard and I think it's going to get harder 
to convince people that we need to keep doing this unless we can in some in some way say, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking of, of even a small contact of people is that I know that the high schools, all of us have high school reunions, mm -hmm. and that possibly your officers from from your graduates at the reunion, it could be a survey that they might do for you mm -hmm. of, of the people who return, who've moved cross country and around the world, a lot do come back for those high school reunions. And True. it may be a basis, yeah. particularly in the last years that you've been right. doing so this do, senior do project. Association. Say, mm -hmm. You had a senior project, mm -hmm. how did it work out for you? Where what are you are doing your now? life today? What are you doing? I uh, that would be really, really, really interesting. But it's, I mean, it's a contact. Yeah. You, you certainly could contact Yeah, them. and they do the Alumni Association, and, and, yes. and yeah, it's a yeah. good idea. Well, it's a requirement for graduation here. Is this pro, um, senior project offered at Yorktown and WNL? No. Like mm -hmm. So they've had, but, they but have if somebody experience. wants to come, is there fairly open enrollment? To Wakefield? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, so if somebody wanted, from Yorktown or WNL, wanted this opportunity yes. to do this, they could they could transfer in. Yep. Okay. And what's the senior experience? It's three weeks at the end of the, we actually, the, the counselors at all this, we, we did a comparison. It's three weeks at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It's not a requirement. It's an elective. Um, it, it'll, it, you have to have a certain GPA. It's not. High, it's like two five or something like that. It's not like it's outrageous, but it does disqualify a lot of kids. Um, and it's, it, it's basically the, the last few weeks you're not in school anymore. Um, a lot of those kids that do that have opportunities. They have parents with connections, or they have our kids. Just, it's a different population. You know, it, it, transportation issues. Um, we want our kids taking final exams. And to be honest, I was interviewed a few years ago by, I think it was Arlington now, and they interviewed some of our kids here, and our kids actually said, you know, I don't want to be gone for my la the last three weeks of my senior year. You know, I want to be in school. These are like the last, so as much as it's cool to, you know, be out of school and say, I don't have to do my exams, our kids, it's really, a, it's a very sentimental time at the end of the year, so they, they're not anxious to be gone, gone. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's not available to other schools, but... Um, Darcy was just up there. Did you see her? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, she did an amazing job. She really, she, she really just blew us all out of the water. I mean, we knew she was good and that she was getting a lot of great experience, but um, her ability to articulate stuff that, um, you know, has been very private to her most of her life is just really pretty uh, impressive. Yeah. How many teachers uh, serve as advisors on you? Um, there, oh, I, I coordinate, so I don't have a class of my um, own, but there are like 12, and a couple of them are, several, several of them are co-taught, so that there's a special education teacher and a general ed teacher mm -hmm. together, and, and, and there are kids in those, that class with IEPs and not. Um, yeah, so I think there's two or three of the co-taught classes. So it's a lot of teachers. I mean, if you took those teachers out and put them in, in English classes and... You know, it, it would help us with our class sizes. It's, it's one of those things, it's, it's, really, it's really a trade-off. And, and so far, we've just really been able to say this is important enough to our kids, and our, our population is so, so deserving of this kind of experience that it's worth it. So I really, I mean, I really do admire the, the people who've, who've stuck with this in the administration because I know they get pressures from, but we also do get a lot of accolades for this. I get calls many times a week from different school systems wanting to know how we do it, how we structure it, because I think more, and, and there is a whole national movement. Um, Performance-based learning is, is, you know, kids aren't getting it, and um, our kids are. Yeah. Can I ask Darcy, what are your plans for after graduation? Um, I actually got accepted to the Pathways programs at NOVA, um, but after DACA was, um, in-state tuition was given to DACA Dreamers, um, I'm actually taking a deferred year to be able to apply for DACA to receive in-state tuition. So I'm waiting a year to go into college. You mentioned the, uh, your title of your project, but you also referred back and forth to the Dream Project, and I see that shirt you're wearing is yeah. the Dream Project. Could you tell us a little about the Dream Project? Uh, the Dream Project is an unprofit organization. It's a mentoring program that um, basically we meet, we met every Thursday after school at 5.30 to 7.30 at the Education Center in front of Washington Lee. And we would um, go and we have mentors that were previous dreamers and some that weren't. And so they would come in and help us apply for colleges, um, apply for scholarships and all of that. And there's actually, you can apply at the end of mentoring for a scholarship that the organization gives you. 
like a mentoring program. They, mm -hmm. they really support them in many ways. Well, oh, I know about the project. Oh. I just wanted other people to yeah. know about the project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great project. I, I enjoyed it. I met so many people that there was kids from my school that I didn't even know were dreamers as well as me. And we all sat down and we told each other our stories. And there's so resemblance in so many ways, but different. And it, it, it's just like to know that there's people out there trying to help us, even people that aren't dreamers and people that, that were born here are trying to help us. It was, it was a great, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I must compliment you on your presentation. Yeah, and I must good. say that your, your oral presentation and your speaking was just delightful. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Anything yes. else? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here, for all of your support. We really, really treasure it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I teach an architectural drawing class. We use Revit software. Revit is a architectural professional level software. The architects for this building use Revit to do the plans and drawings for Wakefield. The first year architecture class, we do residential. And what we do is we do one house for the whole year. What I have students do is pick their second most favorite teacher to be a client. He's the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're saying that. Thank you. So they find a faculty member that they know and love, and have, I have them interview that client, find out about their family, the kind of lifestyle, what kind of house they need and desire. We try to keep the project really as real as possible. They work with that client throughout the whole year. They'll come back and we'll do sketches on tracing paper. They come back and say, well, this is our first go around with the floor plan. What do you think? A lot of interaction back and forth with the client. So Revit is a software that with one file, you can design a house and look at it multiple different ways. And it does everything from all the way from the floor plan to the 3D view doing the construction documents. By the time they're done in June, they can actually have a set of plans where they can go out and build the house. So you can take a look at it with the roof off. It does interior renderings. So you can see what the kitchen looks like. Again, just another floor plan. Exterior deck. Again, we do that full set of construction documents. So they do sections, dimensioning, electrical plans, details, the whole nine yards. The advanced architecture class, second and third year, that Evelyn's in, we switch more to commercial. So right now, the advanced students are just finishing up an office building. This is one of the renderings of the office building from one side, from the other side. It's actually one of Evelyn's designs. We said it was a bank, and we decided, I decided to do it more openly and weird, and I wanted something that everybody could see too. We, we kind of took it off after the banking crisis, knowing that community banks now wanted to be open and transparent. So we tried to put that into the architecture component, right? Architecture is a big response to community needs. We also have this nice new piece of equipment here in our hands-on piece. It's a laser cutter that will make models. And I'll let Evelyn talk a little bit about that. Well, the 3D printer, well, first of all, we're actually the only school in Arlington that has a 3D printer. And what we're able to do is our designs, whatever we design on the computer, we're able to print it through that um, laser cutter. And before, when building models, you would have to like cut it with a knife. Now that prints it all like in one instant, and then we just build it and set it up. Which gives us a better core idea of like, well, how are we designing this? Why is the print that we make? Does it work? Is it functional? Do I like the style? Do I not like it? What changes would I make? And we figure out that that's, those thoughts and those problems we might have in the real world, in an architect already has, and it's already a big house. And then how we do that? So this really is university level uh, application. You'll find this in a lot of universities for the engineers and architects making models using the laser cutter. Really is a great tool. 
I also teach a technical drawing class, which is an AutoCAD class, a 2D class. And in there, we do the engineering type of drawings, kind of standard stuff, detailing parts and such. We also do some historical buildings, illustrations. Again, these are all student sketches. Yes. Yeah, these are all computer based classes. So they're in the next door here on the computers, and then we use this room to actually build. I had them design a go kart track. Got to keep their interest. <laughs> For engineering, the engineering class uses a software called Inventor, which is a 3D modeling program that does a good job. So on this computer program, you can actually model most anything. It does a good job of illustrating what it does. You can also do assembly drawings. So it's the 3D software, the Inventor, that students use to design objects, and then we use the 3D printers to actually make them. So for this example, one of the first things we have them do is design a little toy train. So they design it with the software, they use the 3D printer to actually print those pieces. One of the students right after he did that decided that he'd like a little pencil case for pencils and his earbuds. Because all students always have earbuds. So he designed it using the software, and again with the 3D printer, he made his own little pencil earbud case. So again, real practical applications. They also just recently built a catapult. Again, we find a lot of times students or teenagers don't have hands-on using tools, taking things apart, putting them back together. They're always media-driven or online or with their iPhone. So we try to have them actually do hands-on things of designing and building and problem solving. So using our tools and our equipment here in the lab, they built the catapults, practice their math skills to make sure everything fit together. Then they tested their catapults to knock down the uh, monster. <laughs> you gotta have some reward, right, for your invention. They also do some electronics. This is a small computer that they all wired up. I'm not sure exactly what it did, but it, I couldn't figure it out, but the engineers did. They also do robotics. We've got some robotic kits over here where they put together a robot, and then they use some Java programming to actually program the robot to do different tasks. This was a competition they did regionally where a team of the engineering students went out and competed against other high schools and did quite well. Also, just recently, they went on a field trip to the Harley-Davidson Manufacturing Company in Pennsylvania, because there are not very many manufacturing companies in Arlington. <laughs> so they went out and they saw how motorcycles are designed, put together, and rolled out. They also went to the potato chip company, again, engineering. They took those potatoes and they had a plan to turn them into potato chips. So it's a good eye-opening exercise as to what manufacturing is really like. So that's our little presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Evelyn and I. Yes? Is this an elective course? It's an elective class. There's no prerequisites. I've had freshmen, juniors, sophomores, seniors take the class. And how many credits? One credit. But we also do dual enrollment with NOVA. So for the drawing classes, they get architecture credit for engineering credit or technical drawing credit here at Wakefield, and credits for the NOVA classes that are the comparable classes. Arlington picks up, there's a very small fee on the public schools, so it's no cost to students. They walk out of here with high school and college credit. Thanks for the chips. Who pays for the trips? Parents. It was a charge because they had to rent a bus. It was a full day trip. So it was a nominal charge, I think $40. But it was an extended trip. Yes, sir? Uh, first of all, if I was in high school, I don't think I would leave this room. <laughs> I'm with you. 
I know this is all this is all brand new. I know where I'm going to spend my summer. <laughs> right? Because when I'm teaching, I don't have all the time to play with all this nice stuff. Uh, I noticed you got this uh, Techno CNC. Uh, yes. I, I'm guessing this is was a movable table, and then you've got what looks like it's Rebel attached to the top. It's a milling machine. Okay. Uh, you, are you programming in G code? Actually, the equipment's brand new. I'm not the engineering teacher. Oh, okay. That's more the engineering teacher. That's the wrong table for it. You can see it's turned sideways. Yeah. Most of the equipment, since we're brand, we just moved in in September. Most of the equipment got here maybe a third of the way into the year, and then it took some time to get it set up. We had some training on it. So a lot of the equipment is brand new. We're still just learning it. We've been using the laser cutter a lot. But for the CNC machine, we're still just working our way through it. That's what we'll be doing this summer. Is that something that came out of the training? Yes, this is one of the models from one of the students. You can see that it does really fine cutting with the laser. That you can actually, you know, do the windows and a little handrail and cut very precisely. Yes. After seeing your open bank. I think you're a wonderful candidate to be an intern in my house <laughs> and redesign a couple of rooms. Like, oh, I would yeah. love to. I would love to. I am really excited, actually. That's a good idea, don't you think? Absolutely. We'll talk later about what to charge you. <laughs> <laughs> so, question. What scale do you work? What scale? You mean for the drawing? Oh, no. Actually, I don't practice anymore as an architect. I gave that up because. Oh, the scale model. One fourth. One fourth. Question. Actually, it's a comment. I just can recall you when I was in the army in 1965. We did all the stuff. We were doing drawing by hand. Yeah. T square and a pencil. Yeah. Yeah, I, that, I learned the same thing in high school and college. My early years as an architect. Exactly. Are there safe classes? Uh, I think at the Career Center there's going to be an enrichment class for this, but not here at Waco. Yes, sir. I know when I was in high school, different state, different time, there was. I don't want to say a stigma against technical education, but there was a stigma against technical education. It was seen as not academic. Students were thinking of how they're going to track away from it. Right. Um, do you still find that that is the case and it's going to help you guys here with the work within that environment? So. The stigma, I don't think, is such a big issue as just the student's schedule. It is really difficult these days for students to put 10 pounds of worms in that five pound can. With the AP classes they want to take and love taking, with the requirements from the state, like the personal finance class, we at Wakefield have a senior project class, which is really important. It's just really difficult to fit it into their schedule. That's my biggest challenge as an elected teacher. Not that they don't want to, So many hours. Are you going to do your senior project in something to do with architecture? Well, yeah. Um, I'm taking three of these next year. One of them is going to take two periods. So I told Mr. Taylor I want to take your class next year because I want to play more with a 3D printer. So he told me the next year in Virginia there's rules. So if my senior project has something to do with architecture, I can actually take this class and make that my senior project. So that's what I'm going to do, because my senior project is going to be basically on how to build a house from foundation to when it's sold. That's what I want to do. So, Good luck. Thank you. Can I volunteer my house? <laughs> <laughs> I will have you in mind. I'm on my own street. Yes? If I worked in this room all day, the sound of this ventilating system would bother me. Is this more well, intense? Well, this is our first year in the building. We're still got the contractors here in the building, finessing and correcting things. This actually just started since we switched over to air conditioning. 
and I notice it too. It blows all the time. So I put in a request or a report saying it's not working correctly, and then they will follow up and, and catch it, but it should not be on all the time. Well, I was wondering if it had to do with special ventilation for the work you were doing. We do have special ventilation. We've got an exhaust hood over there in the corner when students are making uh, devices that are anything that creates a fume. Actually, the laser cutter's got its own built-in filters. Can you tell us more about the, uh, the hot box thing, how it feels? The geothermal? Yes, please. So one of the green techniques that we've incorporated here is called geothermal. Geothermal uses the ground temperature to either heat or cool down water. We run a water system here in the building where during the winter, we run hot water through all the pipes. There's a radiator in each room. We blow air across the hot water, blows in the hot air. System reverses in the summer where we run cold water. Now, normally in a regular building, you'd have to heat up that water or chill it down. By using the earth temperature, we can modify that range that we have to either heat or cool the water. I understand there's gonna be 400 wells out there that go down 150 feet. How big are these wells? Really they have a pipe that's about three or four inches. It just circulates the water down. The ground temperature underground is constant 55 degrees. So if we have you know, 75 degree water and we pump it down, it's gonna just through thermal economic or It'll go down to 55. So we've saved that 20 degrees of cooling without putting energy into it. Because pumps are really cheap. So it's going to be a real energy saver. One of the things we're also going to have in the town hall, we're going to have a boilerplate computer, big screen thing. It'll have graphs and monitors on all these energy saving techniques we're using. So students can go in and see, well, how much is the geothermal saving? versus regular. How much is the passive water heating system? How is the photovoltaic system saving us money? So we really see it as a learning opportunity. Yes? Do you require rock protection? Pardon? Do you require rock protection for the students? When they're using the equipment, yes. Right. Yeah. Now you have solar panels. What percentage of your electricity are you generating? Well, or is that for just that's for heat? still to be determined when we get the big computer thing in the town hall. Mm -hmm. We'll have readouts of actually how much it is saving. I think right now everything's still getting tweaked and modified and polished, and so everything's not quite 100% yet, but we're getting there very quickly. Yes? Back to the geothermal, how much uh, square footage do all of these uh, uh, pipes take? It's going to be underneath the baseball and softball fields. Oh, so the stuff above it is still usable. Yeah, you won't see anything at all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight.